My name is Sari Kaufman. When I was 15, a gunman entered my school, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, and murdered 17 of my classmates, teachers, and friends. Ever since, I've been fighting against gun violence. And I am so happy that we finally have a president and vice president who are making schools safer. of gun violence impacts every community. School shooting drills are adding to this fear and anxiety. While we must be prepared, we should not be traumatizing students. That is why I am grateful to President Biden and Vice President Harris for not only leading on the issue of gun violence, but showing compassion while they do it. This leadership is something I have seen firsthand. Vice President Harris has comforted survivors across our country. She has walked the halls of my school in Parkland alongside the families of the victims. She has listened to Gen Z leaders and understands how we are feeling. And she leads the first ever White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention. <laughs> to introduce the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. been traveling our country for many years, meeting with extraordinary heroes, and um, you are really an extraordinary <laughs> leader. And when I look at you, I know the future of our country is bright. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. And to all the all the leaders here, um, survivors, family members. Loved ones, thank you all for the work that you do and the voice that you carry for so many who are not in this room right now, but deserve to be seen, deserve to be known, deserve to be heard. I thank you all for all that you do to sacrifice your time and your hearts to give what you give to so many. And so it is good to be with everyone, including our extraordinary President Joe Biden. <laughs> together, whether the cameras are in the room or not. He cares about the American people. He loves the American people. And he, in his leadership, so much of his leadership is always about fighting for the dignity of all people and understanding the pain that many might experience and what we must do as leaders to alleviate that pain. And I thank you, Mr. President, for all that you are. Congress who are here, all the leaders who are here, I thank you. So before I begin, I will say a few words about uh, Hurricane Helene. Um, so the President and I, of course, are monitoring the case and the situation closely, and we urge everyone who is watching at this very moment to take this storm very seriously 
and please follow the guidance of your local officials. And President Biden and I, of course, will continue to work closely with state and local officials to ensure that everyone is safe and to protect communities before, during, and after the storm. So with that, I will turn to the subject at hand. I believe the right to be safe is a civil right. Yeah. And that the people of America have a right, then, to live, work, worship, and learn without fear of violence, yes. including gun violence. Yes. And yet, our nation is experiencing an epidemic of gun violence. Yeah. I'm telling a bunch of leaders who know. Today, one in five Americans has a family member that was killed by gun violence. Gun violence is now the number one cause of the death of children in America. Not car accidents, not cancer, gun violence. The number one cause of death for the children of America. And this is the result of many, many issues, including mass shootings and school shootings that are too frequently occurring in our nation. And it is, of course, the result of everyday gun violence, which occurs in cities and neighborhoods and towns across our nation. And we know that the prevalence of this violence causes trauma that is far too often undiagnosed and untreated. Yeah. Yes. Which means that the effect of it is from that moment and lingers for a lifetime if we don't take seriously what are the seen and visible and unseen injuries that result from this violence. Over the years, I've held the hands of far too many mothers and fathers to try and comfort them after their child was killed by gun violence. And let us all agree, it does not have to be this way. We know. we know how to stop these tragedies. And it is a false choice to suggest you are either in favor of the Second Amendment or you want to take everyone's guns away. I am in favor of the Second Amendment, and I believe we need to reinstate the assault weapons ban. And have universal background checks safe storage laws, and red flag laws. When we took office, we promised to take on the crisis of gun violence. And we passed, under the President's leadership, the first major gun safety law in nearly 30 years, a bipartisan law, which includes an historic investment to address the trauma caused by gun violence. We are hiring 14,000 new mental health counselors in public schools across our nation. We need to hire more. We need to hire more. But it is the single largest investment in student mental health in history. And for as much as we have accomplished, more must be done. We need more leaders. We need more leaders like the leaders in this room in Congress who have the courage to take action, to stand up to the gun lobby, and to put the lives of our children first. Last week, <laughs> last week I met with a young leader. Her name is Natalie. She is a 15-year-old student at Appalachie High School and a survivor of gun violence. When we met, Natalie was still wearing bandages. And she is extraordinarily brave. And so on behalf of her, on behalf of all the survivors, all the survivors that we have lost, let us continue to fight to end the epidemic of gun violence and to keep our communities and our children safe. And now. to introduce
produce a leader and a friend who understands the urgency of this crisis. He is a mayor who knows firsthand what it is like to lose a loved one to gun violence and to see his community shaken by tragedy. A dear friend who is not only a local leader but a national leader, please welcome Mayor Randall Woodfin. Thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone and thank you for the introduction, Madam Vice President. As stated, my name is Randall Woodfin. I am honored to serve as mayor of the city of Birmingham, Alabama. I want you all to know that I am not here representing myself. I am here representing the 200,000 residents I serve. Gun violence. Gun violence is very, what I would say, very personal to me. Because I know the scream of a mother when her child is killed. I know that because I heard it from the voice of my own mother when my brother was killed by gun violence. I know that scream, I heard that scream again this past Saturday as the lives of four people were stolen and 17 other victims were shot during the horrific mass shooting in Birmingham. Saving lives. Saving lives should not be partisan. That's right. Saving lives should not be Democrat or a Republican thing. Saving lives, everyone. Saving lives shouldn't even be political. Saving lives is the most American thing we can do together. And so we've been working with our U.S. Attorney, with the Justice Department, to get machine gun conversions, like Glock switches, off our city streets. But still, my community, and I imagine other communities, mm -hmm. are still finding the use of these devices at crime scene after crime scene. And so that is why I'm grateful to our president. That is why I'm so grateful to our vice president as well, who today are taking more action to help people, not only in Birmingham, but across our country. Today, we work to loosen the grip that gun violence has on our communities. I know firsthand what it means to have a president who is not only a partner, but a friend to community and cities. The Biden-Harris administration is making historic and transformative investments in our neighborhoods, That's right. but most importantly, in our people. That's right. Instead of being overlooked, I am happy to stand on this stage and tell you we have a president who not only sees us, yes. but truly believes in us. Yeah. And that is why it is my honor to introduce President Joe Biden, who has been a key player to Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for your introduction. <laughs> and quite frankly, for your extraordinary leadership in Birmingham. Yeah. You know, uh, through your love for your brother, 
helping ensure that he and all victims of gun violence have not died in vain. May I ask a question? How many of you in this audience have lost someone in the family to gun violence? I know from experience of other losses that this is bittersweet. We want us to be doing this, but it brings back the very moment it happened, no matter how long it, since it's occurred. You're here and you remember. Remember the first time you heard my son, my daughter, my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, somebody. You lost. I know the feeling in a different context. And it's heartbreaking. So thank you for the courage to be here. I know, I know the intensity of your feelings. But thank you, because it really does require to relive the moment it occurred. And that's tough. And I don't think people who haven't been through the loss of someone uh, through an accident or through violence fully understands it. So it happens. And I hope that it doesn't happen to the rest of you in any circumstance. So uh, thank you for, Sari, for sharing your story, and your classmates, your teachers, your friends in Parkland. You know, an extraordinary courage <coughs> inspires a nation. And we stand with you, for real. Quite frankly, you inspired me when I met many of you after that tragedy. Before I begin, let me speak to our preparedness, as then very briefly for the hurricane. Helena, we're expecting a catastrophic storm. Winds and flooding throughout the southeast, starting in Florida right now. Kamala and I have been briefed and spent many hours with FEMA, including recently. Ambassador Griswell is on the scene tomorrow. I've directed FEMA to work with the state partners to take proactive measures to ensure the communities in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Alabama, Tennessee, South Carolina, and other states have the support and resources they need. That includes improving pre-landfall emergency declaration requests from the governors of Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and Alabama. In my direction, more than 1,000 federal personnel have already been deployed to those areas. We have search and rescue teams, medical teams, power restoration teams, generators, water, food, on the ground and ready to support families throughout the coming days. But let me say this. Everyone needs to take it seriously, extremely seriously. The potential storm surge is well beyond the immediate path of the hurricane. It could be significant and deadly. You know, for you and your family's sake, I urge everyone in and near the path of the hurricane to listen to local officials and follow evacuation orders and be when told to do so. You remember, two years ago, just two years ago, 150 people were killed when the surge was only 14 feet. Now the surge is expected to be up to 20 feet. 20 feet. So take this seriously. I, from the bottom of my heart, please take it seriously, anybody listening to this. And uh, because, anyway, the tendency is to say, I can do this, but you can't. 20-foot storm surge, you can't. Folks, now for the reason we're here today. I want to thank Vice President Harris and members of our cabinet, members of the Congress, including Birmingham's extraordinary Congressman Terry Sewell. Terry, yes. stand up. Yes. Stand up. I want to thank Thompson, Mike Thompson. Mike, stand up. And a good friend, one of the brightest people I know, Jamie Raskin. Jamie Stone. <laughs> and Congressman Maxwell Frost, who started by organizing opposition to gun violence, is now the youngest member of Congress. <laughs> Even when I was the second youngest senator in history, I never had that much hair. <laughs> <laughs> and Representative Lucy Macbeth, whose son Jordan was killed by him. <laughs> Thanks, Lucy. Thanks for being here. I know events like this are difficult. Look, folks, I want to thank you for the courage. And I also want to thank the chiefs of police and sheriffs, to all the advocates and allies, and especially to the survivors and families. 
many of whom I've met with. Jill and I have gotten to know some of you very well over the years. Thank you for being here. With absolute courage, you've turned your pain into purpose. That's what it's all about, turning your pain into purpose. Your loss into determination, your anger into commitment, and the power in, of a movement of saving lives. That's okay, babies rule my house. <laughs> This past Monday, the FBI re released data showing how crime is down in America. The year before we came to the presidency, we saw the biggest increase in murder rates on record. Last year, we saw the largest decrease in murder rates nationwide. Yeah, right. The homicide rate in 2023 was 16 percent below the year before we became president and vice president. In the first half of 2024, in large cities across the country, homicide rate dropped another 17 percent. Last year, we also saw the lowest rates of all violent crime in more than 50 years. Murder, rape, aggravated assault, robbery all dropped along with burglary, property crime. It matters. And together, we're making clear if you want to talk about reducing crime and violence in America, you need to talk about guns in America. <laughs> you just heard Kamala cite the statistics all Americans should be ashamed of. Guns are the number one, hard to believe, are the number one killer of children in America, more than any other cause. Accidents, can't, more than any other cause. It's almost in, 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 unbelievable to think that's — it's sick. Last year, after another school shooting, my predecessor said, just said, like some of the members of Congress said, just, quote, just get over it. Yeah. I'm going to be very blunt. Secretary Vance of Ohio has called these shootings facts of life. <laughs> Who the hell do these people think they are? that is ex exempted by law from being investigated and being dealt with is the gun industry. Mm -hmm. Imagine had that be the case with the tobacco industry. Right. What cancer would be like. I mean it sincerely. Right. Think about this. This time last year, we stood in the Rose Garden and launched the first ever White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Yeah. Magnificent Congresswoman, who's always out there fighting. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's staffed by gun violence survivors and experts overseen by our incredible Vice President. The purpose is to drive and coordinate the government and nationwide effort to reduce gun violence in America. Over the past year, we made tremendous progress. More background checks required for firearms sold at gun shows online. New interagency response teams to support communities after mass shootings. And I've been to all but three mass shootings in, in the United States of America and spent time with surviving families, many of whom I see here in this audience, because it's important to raise up what's happening. Most comprehensive federal guide ever on safe gun storage of firearms. First ever Surgeon General's advisory declaring gun violence to be a public health crisis. <laughs> As I travel the world with other world leaders, they ask, do you really have a public — do you say you have a public health crisis with gun violence? Well, today I'm proud to announce a new executive order. That's going to two additional things. First, the executive order will establish a new federal task force on emerging firearm threats. Previously, my administration took action to crack down on private manufacturers of firearms including kits of so-called ghost guns. This is probably the only audience knows what ghost yeah. guns are. Yeah. That's right. They don't have to have a serial number. Guns don't have serial numbers. It's hard for them to track back to the shooter and hold them accountable when something happens. But today, we're taking the next step. Our new task force will address 3D-printed firearms. 
and, I, and for those listening, everybody in this room knows what that is. But they actually can produce a plastic firearm with a 3D printer. That, mag, you know, magnetometers can't detect these, or they don't have a serial number. This task force is all going to tackle machine gun conversion devices were mentioned by the mayor. Devices that illegally turn semi-automatic weapons, including handguns, that turn into fully automatic machine guns that can fire up to 20 bullets in, 20, in one se in two seconds. 20 in two seconds. These devices are already illegal under federal law and can be made on a 3D printer for just 40 cents in less than 30 minutes and sold for as little as $20. The local law enforcement in cities across the country tell me the streets are flooded with machine gun conversion devices. Isn't that right, Captain? Yes, sir. Because the parts are small, cheap, and easy to make. The impact of these devices is devastating. Just this weekend, a machine gun conversion device was found at the scene of a mass shooting in Birmingham. As I can tell you, over 100 shell casings, 100 shell casings are including four killed and 18 injured. The community shattered. Enough. Within 90 days of our task force, will send me a reverse assessment on a strategy to address these emerging firearm threats. It's about, it's about sending a clear message. Don't worry about the babe. It's OK. <laughs> really. Sending a clear message to local law enforcement, the cities across the country, we're to help, and together we can save lives. Look, the second part of this executive order relates to active shooter drills in schools. You know, it's a good thing, but people don't, you all understand, many of you in here, but the psychological impact that has on a child. You know, I'm old enough, we used to have drills for, you know, duck and cover for nuclear devices. But guess what? Now we're talking about kids know what's happening. Yes. Kamala just talked about the worry of parents and the stress and fear of students have when they're told to participate in active sh shooter drills. The lack of guidance today on how to prepare students while minimizing the trauma of active shooter drills is, is, is unacceptable. So today I'm directing the members of my cabinet to return to me within 110 days with resources and information for schools to improve active shooter drills, minimize this harm, create age-appropriate content, and communicate with parents before and after these drills happen so they know what's going on. <laughs> Folks, we, we just have to do better, and we can do better. But that's not all. Today, my administration is also announcing a whole series of new actions to address gun violence. We're releasing a new tool with resources to help schools communicate with parents about safety of storing firearms in their homes. And by the way, I, along with Diane Fines, the guy that passed the first uh, assault weapons ban. And here's the deal. It was amazing, amazing how many of those gun violence occurred with those fire when they were outlawed with, with uh, with these firearms were a consequence of a parent not being responsible with the guns they own. Or, in a recent case, I won't get into it because it's under litigate, a parent who provided an assault weapon to a young child. It's been found that when school administrators communicate with parents about safe storage of firearms in their homes, it motivates parents to act. We're awarding $135 million on top of the $238 million we've already awarded last year to 48 states for crisis intervention. <laughs> Including tools like red flag laws. I'm going to say, be very personal here. My son's attorney general is the first state in the nation to institute that statewide. Removing the temporary and moving firearms from those who are a danger to themselves and others. Yes, right. Well, it's important. We're awarding an additional $85 million of 30 community violence intervention programs on top of the $200 million we've already invested in these programs. As you 
you all know, these local intervention programs stop shooting before they happen, utilizing trusted messengers, right. community right. members, yes. right. leaders to work directly with people at risk or the most vulnerable to gun violence. Yes. Yes. And folks, all these new actions build on the historic steps we've already taken since I took office to address gun violence in America. Through the American, American Rescue Plan, which, by the way, not a single one of the opposition voted for. <laughs> I don't say that for political reasons. I say that to make sure people understand it's not costless to do, do that. To help deliver more than $15 billion, the largest investment ever in public safety. Let me say it again. All my opponents, all our opponents voted against the largest funding ever in public safety. I also announced a dozen executive orders to reduce gun violence more than any of my predecessors. And with your help, we passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the most significant gun violence in the world. And so many things because we had a first-rate prosecutor who had no. Among many things is strengthened background checks for anyone under the age of 21 seeking to purchase a firearm. Since we implemented the background check system last year, we've kept almost 1,000 guns out of the hands of people under the age of 21. But folks, the law also invests over $1 billion, the largest one-time ever investment ever in seeking to deal with mental health issues in our schools. and deal with the grief and trauma of gun violence and other traumatic experiences. We spent a lot of time, didn't we, with those kids? Afraid to go back to school. Not an unusual thing to be concerned about if you sat there and your, the kid sitting next to you and your desk gets shot and killed. My former Senate <coughs> Deputy Chief of Staff is here with me today, Roger Harrison, sitting in the back there. He founded an organization that does outreach programs for middle and high school students dealing with mental health issues and many others around the country doing similar things. We still have more to do. But the steps we've taken so far in reducing gun violence and saving lives are real. But we have to keep going. There's so much more we have to do. I think it's time to reinstate the assault weapons ban and high-capacity yeah. magazines. Senator, and I introduced the first effort to ban them, those weapons. I literally was walking through the swamps of eastern, the northeast, car, excuse me, in southern Delaware, down in the area where the, where the swamps and ridges are. There's a guy fishing. And he looked at me and said, Biden, what the hell are you going to take my gun for? What are you going to take my assault weapon? He was fishing. And I said, <laughs> true story. And I said, you need that? He said, yeah. I said, you must be one hell of a lousy shot. And I don't see a lot of deer running around here wearing Kevlar vests. He said, well, that's not, why do you have it? Well, I hunt. You hunt like hell. Look, it's time we establish universal background check. Universal. Require safe storage of firearms. I mean it. Start holding parents accountable for being negligent. By the way, if you pull up here wherever you parked and you left your key in your car and a student steals the car and gets in an accident, you are held responsible. Why in the hell would that not be the case if you lived a gun case open? I've been fighting for this. I'm going to continue after I leave this office. End immunity for the gun industry. End it, end it, end it. <laughs> Look, folks, I taught constitutional law for years, constitutional law. Never 
was the Second Amendment meant to be absolute? Back when it was passed, you could not own a cannon. No, well, I'm, not, I'm not joking. People like, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the liberty of Americans is water with the blood of patriots. Like hell. <laughs> I'm serious. Think about it. Think about it. It was never absolute. Never, 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 never. It's time we increase funding for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. <laughs> Another law enforcement agency to deal with crime and solve crimes faster. We get a lot of heat from the other guy. She got a lot of heat from the other guy talking about it. We're not helping. We're the ones funding cops. We're the ones funding these things. It's time to increase funding to help victims of crime and support community groups helping hunting and hurting people hurting from gun violence. Unfortunately, my predecessor and a lot of congressional other people opposed all these steps to reduce gun violence. Instead, they tried to stop the crackdown on ghost gun kits, by the way. Well, yeah, that's a real big deal, isn't it? We can't deny the Second Amendment right to uh, give me a break. <laughs> if they got their way, criminals could traffic guns and commit crimes. Congressional our opponents are trying to defund the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. There's an amendment. To defund the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Bless me, Father, as we say in my church. <laughs> they attack the FBI and want to abolish the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives. By the way, that's not written out, which is responsible for fighting gun crimes. Folks, you can't be pro-law enforcement and be anti-FBI and ATF. That's how it works. Well, that's why we're here today and why this is so important. We need your help in fighting and standing up to the gun lobby, gun manufacturers, the politicians who oppose common sense gun legislation. Because whether you're a Democrat or Republican or independent, we all want our families to be safe. When we drop families off at the house of worship or a child at a mall or a movie theater or a school. We don't have to worry about whether it was, that's the last time we've seen them. I mean, think about it. Think about it. We all want our kids to have the freedom to learn how to read and write in schools instead of duck and cover. Let me close with this. I know how difficult this work is, for particularly for some of them who through the tragedies and consequences of it. But I also have no illusions about the champions and heroes in this fight, including all of you. I really don't. Look what you've already done. Look at the movie you built. Look at the elected officials standing alongside me and here today. This is the young people speaking out. That's the power of your loved ones and their memory. And that's the power of this movement. It's the power of America. We just have to keep going and we have faith in who we are. Ladies and gentlemen, we're the United States of America. There is nothing beyond our capacity. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I mean that. I swear to God, I know I look like I'm only 40, but I'm 100 years old. I've been around a long time. I really mean it. There's nothing beyond our capacity. We're the only nation in the world, as a student of history, I can tell you, that's come out of every crisis stronger than when we went in. That's right. And we've got to come out stronger now. Now I'm going to sign this executive order. Thank you. Thank you. The sign is combating emerging firearms threats and improving school-based active shooter drills. Never thought I'd have to sign something like this, but we do. We thank you. Bravo.
Keep it going, boss. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.